Hello, and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app or want to try out a project you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so take a look at our friends over at Linode. With the launch of their managed Kubernetes platform, it's easy to get started with the next generation of deployment and scaling, powered by the battle-tested Linode platform, including simple pricing, node balancers, 40 gigabit networking, dedicated CPU and GPU instances, and worldwide data centers. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash linode today, that's L-I-N-O-D-E, and get a $60 credit to try out a Kubernetes cluster of your own. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. Before you put your code into production, you need to make sure that it passes all of the tests, that it has been packaged with all of the dependencies, and that you haven't introduced any security issues. Instead of running all of that on your laptop, let CodeFresh handle it automatically with their continuous integration and continuous delivery platform. Built for the modern era of cloud-native computing, they make publishing to Kubernetes, serverless platforms, and virtual machines fast and seamless. With a growing library of pre-made steps, a flexible pipeline definition, and unlimited scale, CodeFresh lets you ship faster and safer than ever. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash CodeFresh today to get unlimited builds on your free account. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Param Singh about the ways that Python is being used across the various MetaBrains projects. So Param, can you start by introducing yourself? Sure. Hey, so my name is Param Singh. I'm from India. I studied computer science, like, uh, I graduated, like, a few, uh, just last year. I studied computer science in a university very near the Himalayas. Right now, I'm in Dublin. I work for Stripe, and I have been working for, like, MetaBrains in college since the beginning of 2017, which is almost three and a half years now. So, yeah. And do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Yeah, so I think, like, the first few lines of Python code that I wrote was in high school, I think, like, almost nine or ten years ago. I was a high school junior, just had installed, like, um, Linux on my on the family computer for the first time. So I decided to play around with Python because it just, like, seemed cool. You, you know, the XKCD comic about the import anti-gravity text. Uh, come join us programming is fun again that sort of thing i only knew like java from actual high school classes before that so going from that to python just like opened up a lot of just seemed uh, cool in the sense and then i basically like built small projects using python a scraper for like school teacher profiles etc etc and then it's just been going on since then and you mentioned that you've been working with the MetaBrains projects for about three and a half years now. I'm wondering if you can just give a bit of background into how you first got involved with that and some of the ways that you are engaging with the different projects. All right. So I was actually looking for uh, basically, I used to be like a very avid last FM user. Like um, last FM is basically a site which tracks your music listening history and then like you get statistics out of it, recommendations, all that, all that kind of jazz. But like there were some like complications with last FM where it's got by another company and they got rid of a few features, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which led to me to basically trying to find an alternative. And from there, I came across ListenBrain, which was basically love at first sight because like it was in Python, it seemed cool, and it was all open source which really jives with my personal values in the sense that, like, it's my data, so it shouldn't be just closed down, right? If if anyone wants to use it, and I, if I've made it public, people should be able to use it. So from there on, I just, like, started contributing. I was initially a Google Summer of Code student for Listen Brains, where I basically worked on Listen Brains, and Google paid me to work on Listen Brains for over a summer. For uh, And one of the Meta Brains, uh, one of the Listen Brains team mentored me, and that was... That was when I was like a college junior. So yeah, that's how I got introduced to the MetaBrains Foundation. And from then on, I just like keep kept contributing after Summer of Code part-time while I was a student. And yeah, that's mostly it. So the MetaBrains Foundation is apparent to a number of different projects. I know that Music Brains was the foundational one, but can you give a bit more of an overview about what the organization is and some of the various projects that it encompasses? Mm-hmm, sure. So MetaBrains is basically a non-profit organization registered in California, but we have like core contributors spread across the world, Europe, US, like basically almost all time zones. We have someone who contributes. We believe in like open access to data and we specialize in data sets revolving around music technology. So basically any information about music that someone wants, we probably want to like have it somewhere. So the oldest project that we have is Music Brains. I like to explain Music Brains as 
kind of like wikipedia but for music metadata like suppose you want to build a music app like spotify you would want to know like which artist has released which songs or like what an artist twitter is etc cetera, etc cetera. so we basically crowdsource that information in music brains it music brains has like a total of 2 million editors in total uh, since since it started it's basically the source of truth for music data on the internet right now google bing amazon bbc they all use us for their music information so if you ask any details about a song to your google home or like maybe alexa even i'm not sure about alexa but maybe so they'll probably query the music brain data and get that information from there and anyone can just edit the information so yeah that's music brains the project that i personally spend a uh, spend a lot of time on is listen brains so listen brains started around 5 years ago it's basically just last fm but open source it keeps track of your music listening history it basically started as like hack project between the meta brains people and a few people that founded last fm because they wanted to take a fresh stab at it so yeah that's listen brains acoustic brains is another project that we work on Acoustic brains I like to define as like us trying to find out what music sounds like. We basically try to crowdsource extremely detailed acoustic information like the pitch of a song, the BPM, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then we run like machine learning models on it to calculate more abstract stuff like danceability, whether the song has vocals, are they male vocals or are they female vocals, stuff like that. Other than that, we we do have like um, a few other projects. Like we have uh, Book Brains. Book Brains was started as a community project by people who were basically inspired by Music Brains and they wanted to start something like Music Brains but for books. Critique Brains is another project where we try to collect and make make open music reviews, like opinions about music. Music Brains is more fact based, but Critique Brains is like where, a place where you can put your specific opinions about the music. So yeah I think that's about it we also maintain and develop a small app which we called Picard which people use to like actually use music brains data and use it to organize your music collections so yeah I think I think that's a decent overview of all the projects that we have it's a lot of projects for like a pretty small team but <laughs> we try to make do <laughs> And as you mentioned, a big component of these projects is the data that's actually collected using the systems that you build for facilitating that. And I'm wondering what the overall goals are for making all that information publicly available and some of the foundational inspiration for the MetaBrains Foundation, if you have any of that context. Yeah, sure. Um, so when music brain started, I was probably only a baby, but the story is really interesting, and like I can tell what the story is. So this is back in 1996 when people, when like the internet was just getting popular and things were things like that were happening. There was this service called CDDB that people used to basically store information about their compact discs, right? And they they submit that information to CDDB.com, and then everyone could use it, and yeah. but it wasn't open source and what happened was that it basically got by a company and it became private so basically like huge number of contributors who contributed a large amount of data to a server it basically uh, with the assumption that it would remain public that that became private so that resulted in a large like public outcry and people were basically angry and it led to the start of a bunch of open source projects that wanted to be like the competitor to cddb.com so music brains was one of those one of those competitors eventually we just like took it and ran with it and um, right now i don't think like we have any real competitors in terms of music metadata right now in the sense that uh, we're almost the source of truth as i said earlier so yeah eventually the meta brains foundation was set up to actually like maintain the data because having an organization versus a person is just like a um, good practice so that stuff like this doesn't happen again the rest of the projects are basically just like logical extensions to music brains right so we have all this data why not build an app like picard to help people organize or organize their collections we have all the facts about music why don't we actually start collecting opinions too so that led to pretty brains why not start crowdsourcing more detailed information like acoustic brain stuff so it they basically just like extensions of what music brain stuff and they're all like relatively long games so music brain really became useful to people about like maybe a decade or two after it got started right 
um, acoustic brains and listen brains and all the other projects they're relatively younger so they're not very useful to anyone right now but we're hopeful that like they'll get a critical mass like maybe years down the line and then they'll be useful to people so yeah that's the i guess the origin story for meta brains the motivations our motivations are basically like very simple we just want to like make sure that all this data it it remains it we're just trying to democratize all the data right um right now if you look at it most of the data the big companies the big four or whatever they have they have the data and and like if you're trying to build a competitor to those services you probably won't be able to because like it's just not realistic but if we succeed then that leads to most a lot of the stuff going into the open which leads to basically a democratization where people can actually build competitors to huge services while being small and agile i guess and digging more into the technology, as you said, Music Brains was the first iteration, the first project of the foundation. And because of the time at which it was created, it was implemented in Perl, which was one of the more popular languages. But all of the more recent projects have been implemented in Python. So I'm curious what the motivation was for switching to Python for all these other more recent Music Brain or for all these other MetaBrains projects and continuing to maintain Music Brains as a Perl app. Mm-hmm. So just one small correction there, I guess. Book Brains started off as a community project and it's actually written in JavaScript. You know, Node, Express, React, the user of Shebang. We still maintain it, but it is in JavaScript. But other than that, the choices, the specific decision about going to Python from Perl was a bit before my time at MetaBrains, but I can still take a stab at explaining the intentions behind them. I think a major reason was that Perl just isn't very popular among developers these days. And this shows up for us in the number of new contributors that we get to our projects. Uh, BookBanes, which is written in JavaScript, it has like a huge number of new people, like new developers wanting to contribute. Our Python projects also have like a reasonable amount of new contributors who are able to like, if it's a small thing, just go ahead and fix it. And if, if they want to like make more core changes, they're still, they're still like volunteering. Music Beans is right now harder to contribute to these days because mostly because there's just not like many people who are, who are willing to learn Perl to actually start contributing or many people who want to program in Perl in the file time, in the free time, right? So I think that was one of the reasons why we went to Python. Another reason was that our Python environment, just Flask or SQL Alchemy or stuff like that, it's just like really nice to use. So it really helps us work at a fast pace and like it's just fun to develop in another reason would probably be Perl 6 so it was Perl 6 was obviously going to be very different from like Perl 5 and it had been looming around for a long time and Perl 6 basic basically meant that we were going to have to change languages at some point of time no matter what so if we are going to change languages then we probably want to go with like something that's better for like our use cases and flask and sql alchemy and that stuff just really like seem perfect so yeah and i think that those are like major reasons for us starting with python now in terms of the sustainability of the foundation and the work that you're doing how does the metabrains project approach that and where does the funding come from oh yeah so we basically so a few years ago, we basically relied just on donations in the sense that people who use their site would donate to us and that would go to the server costs or developers or developers or like payroll and stuff like that. But that wasn't really working out because like our major real users, they were businesses and our individual users or the editors of music games, they don't really have like much incentive to donate to us. Like they're already contributing their data, right? Asking them to contribute money as well was like not ideal. So in the end, what happened was that we, our executive director came up with something that he likes to describe as the drug dealer mod. So the data that we have is free, right? And, and it's easy to use. So what engineers do is that if they're building stuff, they just download it and like build their cool stuff. Mostly this stuff gets released without us even knowing about it. Eventually those products, they get at least medium and we come to know about, we, we find out that this product is using our data. So we knock on their doors and we ask them to support us. And these are not exactly like core music industry companies. These are mostly music technology companies, right? So mostly what happens is that like executives will try to find other sources of this data, like maybe try to find an alternative. 
most of the alternatives are like orders of magnitude more expensive and not nearly as accurate so eventually what happens is that and we basically go to them and tell us that you need to support us because we need funding to actually maintain the service that you're using and eventually they just pay us right so a really fun anecdote about this about our like funding model is the amazon case story i really like telling this story to people because it's always like very fun so what happened was that amazon was basically like 3 years behind in paying us we had sent them like an invoice and it had been 3 years since they'd accepted that they paid it and they hadn't paid it right so our executive director had basically like been following them for months asking for the payments etc etc so eventually what he did was that he said he sent them an email saying if you don't pay in 2 weeks i'm going to send you a cake so a cake and yeah a cake which it will basically say congratulations on the th- third anniversary of invoice number 144 so they did panic that a bit but it didn't happen the third year anniversary cake came and like our executive director sent us on the cake right it got some traction in like some blogs etc etc amazon did get like a bit panic so our executive get and director eventually got call from like um, head of legal head of music head of anything etc and eventually what happened was that the cake was sent on a tuesday and finally the check came in on a friday right so that's the point that we realized that it's really just a matter of like getting these huge companies who actually use our data to pay us and like that's when we set up entirely different site called metapayments.org where we ask people to basically use our data for free if it's for non commercial purposes but if it is for commercial purposes then please do support us we have different tiers of um, of support where we if it's a non profit or if it's a university or something then that's basically just free but if they're a small startup we we ask them for a small amount of money etc if it's a huge startup we have a tier called like unicorn which is for really 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 big companies like google or microsoft or amazon etc so that's basically our funding model right now in the sense that people just start using our data and eventually we find out about it we ask them to support us and at that point they just so hooked into the data that it's probably more expensive for them to like actually switch versus just not just supporting us and in terms of the sustainability of the projects a lot of open source work the sustainability question is just around the development time that goes into building it and then the actual use and integration falls on the people who are the downstream consumers whereas in the metabrains project case as you mentioned there's a substantial amount of data that's been accrued so you also have these hosting costs and server and ongoing maintenance and uh data management questions so i'm wondering how you allocate the funds that you do receive from these companies who are supporting you and some of the challenges that you face in determining what feature sets to develop and determining the roadmap of these projects and managing the overall data and its longevity mm-hmm. so in terms of finances i think all of our finances are public and anyone can see what we're spending the money on in terms of like actual prioritization i think what really happens is that music brains is basically our star product and we we try to make sure that it has all the resources that it needs to actually keep running and be sustainable and like just run all the way through so it's been right now has like i think two developers who are full time on it and like one developer who's like part time on it the rest of the employees pro- because they're not like bringing in much money right now and because they're long games they don't have as many resources allocated to them as we'd like to because we are still like resource we don't have like huge piles of money so i realistically what happens is that we try to make do with as much as we have as much as possible and try to just keep them running as well as possible but in the end i don't think like there's any specific very huge plans around like okay this percent of the money needs to go there it's we mostly played by ear and like just reasonable precautions in the sense that right now i'm pretty sure that we always try to keep like one year's worth of money in the bank account in liquid form so that like even if all our supporters went away tomorrow we'd be able to run your brains for at least a year and it's mostly just like stuff like that thinking about worst cases and making sure that those don't happen and it's not very ideal but i think that's mostly what we do 
And with these multiple projects that the MetaBrains Foundation is responsible for, how is the overall development of them organized? You mentioned that there are two full-time engineers dedicated to Music Brains, but in terms of organizing the work being done on these different projects, is it just the typical open source approach of here are a bunch of issues, everybody works on what they feel like, and eventually it ends up being something that's useful and usable by the broader community? Or is there some more directed effort that goes into determining what gets worked on by whom and when? So realistically, I'd say that, so I think as with most things, it's a compromise between them. So we have like, I think, four or five developers who actually, who we have contracts with. And the rest of the developers are basically volunteers. So in the end, what happens realistically is that there's always stuff that's not as like the thing that people want to do in the free time. That's stuff that needs to be done, but getting volunteers for it would be like very hard. So in the end, what happens is that the contractors, the people who actually work full time on stuff and get paid by the MetaBrain Foundation, they mostly spend their time on stuff like that and actually just keeping the project running and making sure that like if something comes in from a huge customer or something, then that issue or anything is fixed, et cetera, et cetera. But other than that, we do all of our work in the open, just like all open source projects. Our roadmaps, our planning documents, our design documents, they're all public and anyone can see them. Uh, the, and so other than that, our, our development chats are all happen on IRC and are publicly logged. So after that, it just becomes like the case of how a project wants to, how a project wants to go ahead, right? So I personally have a thread open in our Discord forums, basically asking our users, like our community, what they want from Listen Games. We use all of that stuff to like prioritize what needs to get built and then just try to go ahead and build some part of that and like then go back again, see the feedback build something else, et cetera, et cetera. The Google Summer of Code program has been like really impactful for MetaBrain specifically. Every summer Google sponsors a few students to like come and work with us on an internship of sorts. And students just basically propose their own project and we mentor them while they code away. I was introduced to MetaBrain via Google Summer of Code and so were like, an, a, I'd say like a huge number of other high impact contributors. And because we're like a very small team, it's easy to like stay in sync on what someone is working on so that we don't like step on anyone's toes. But overall, um, in terms of prioritization, it's mostly just like us. It's mostly just a mixture of us building things that we want from the project versus us like taking user feedback in and trying to build those things as well, just to make sure that our users actually like the project and like a bunch of hanging out and just hacking on stuff. So for the projects themselves, you mentioned that the Python projects are generally built around Flask and SQL Alchemy. I'm wondering how much of the overall architectural design is shared across the projects and how much divergence there is among them and just some of the complexities involved in moving between the different projects as a contributor. Mm -hmm. So basically, our, all our Python projects, they have the same like basic tech stack, Python, Flask, Postgres, basically the Redis, et cetera, et cetera. They're also like structured pretty similarly. So if you're like familiar with one of them, you can probably easily start on the others too. That's that's mostly just because it's mostly just like three same co-founders who found who started all the three projects. But the thing that happens is that all the projects like diverge on their specific use cases. For example, listen beans diverges from the rest of them, rest of the projects in terms of its like data pipelines. Listen mains can have like a lot of data coming in at points of at at specific points of time because like there's a lot of people listening to music at a specific point of time. That's not the case with like music brains because it's mostly just editors, right? So for listen brains, we basically like the short explanation would be we receive data from the API, put it into RabbitMQ, a RabbitMQ consumer then writes it into our time series database. From there we have periodic dumps. And from those go to Spark and like um, from there we calculate stuff like statistics, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's listen range. Compared to that, acoustic range is different because like a lot of incredibly detailed low level data that people send. So if we don't have like those pipeline problems that listen range has, but we, we have like a large amount of data that we need to run machine learning models on. So the pipeline for that is completely different from the pipeline for listen range because because they have different use cases and the, the ways to scale them is just different. So 
that's basically where the all the divergences between the different projects really come from different use cases and lead to different technologies being used as we see being used like a machine learning model that's built by MTG and the music technology group at a university in Barcelona because like uh, acoustic brains was a partnership with them so yeah while listen brains we just started doing machine learning with listen brains but we have to do that in spark because it's basically like we built out our entire spark cluster for listen brains so yeah the, i guess i guess like they really diverge when the use cases and when the use cases diverge but overall i think it'd be easy for one person to move from like listen brains development to acoustic brains development pretty easily because they basically all have the same structure and almost the same coding style of the same testing framework etc cetera, etc cetera. it's all is the same but except for the places where it's different i guess <laughs> Yeah, and that's interesting too in terms of the supporting tooling that you're using to help maintain some of that consistency and some of the ways that you're using Python there. You mentioned testing and some of the coding styles. I'm wondering if you can just discuss a bit more about the conventions that you've built up to help facilitate that transition between projects and maintain the consistency and just the overall maintainability of multiple projects with a small team. Right. Yeah. So I guess the first thing here is that we're basically Python everywhere. In even if we're like building small tools that aren't supposed to actually go into the core repository or the core code bases, they're they're almost always in Python because we're just like we're good at Python now. We have been running Python for like years, and it's something that we know how to run well and how to just work with. So yeah. So what we do right now is we have different Git repositories for each of the projects. Like Listen Brains has a different Git repository, Acoustic Brains has a different Git repository, Critique Brains has a different Git repository. And if we need to like share share code between them, like we have a different um, utils kind of Python library that we also maintain called Brains Utils, which basically contains stuff like that. We have a Flask extension in it. Which is configured for our environment. It has like uh, sentry integration, logging, rate limits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if I was building all this like again, I would probably like tend towards putting all of this into a mono repo because like having just a single re- having just a single repository for all of these projects because that would definitely make sharing code across um, different projects much easier. But right now, what we basically do is that because we're a small team and everyone. basically everyone has like at least some idea on what someone else is working on and it's basically just like um if someone is working on something that might be of interest to some other project then then we'll probably try to think of a way to like put it in brain tutorials just to make sure that other projects don't have to like do the same work again so yeah our python environment right now is like very mature and it's it's really hard to displace it for any kind of tooling that we really need to build and i don't really see that changing any time soon. And the interesting outlier too among all of these projects is the Picard application that you mentioned because it's a desktop program and built using Python and Qt. So I'm wondering if you can discuss a bit about some of the ways that that stretches the development tooling and just some of the work that goes on to keep that relatively consistent with the other programs. Hmm. So, we did have like a, this interesting use case where Picard basically needs a website that people can download it from. So, what happened was that when we were like writing a new version of the of that website, we basically just like took code from the existing projects and then just remodeled it. So that was really interesting, but overall, Picard is like um, a completely different application. So there, there isn't like much of code sharing between Picard and one of our like web services data projects. But yeah, I think the web server and we have like a extension API for Picard, which is based on Flask, and I think those things definitely like really took the learnings from our our like api development in acoustic brain or listen brain and then just done with it and that was a nice example of us taking old learnings and just taking them and running them again and not having to basically duplicate a lot of work so yeah another element of these projects beyond just the server side aspects is the data modeling and the fact that you have existing data so any schema evolution needs to take into account the potential for breakages or mutations i'm wondering how that gets factored into the planning and the overall review process and making sure that you don't accidentally 
change things too drastically or that you have a common set of base attributes that you use across the different projects for managing the metadata? So I think we haven't had many problems with stuff like schema changes. That's mostly because we've been running music brains for uh, music brains for like um, over 20 years now and music brains is like very and music brains has definitely given us like opportunities to learn how to actually do this stuff very well music brains it has to like walk a thin line between people actually being able to understand what the schema represents and like people being able to input data into the schema without act, without having to read like books about it and still having a detailed and detailed enough schema that that that's actually useful for people and so that it's actually easy to write queries on by actual developers. I think I think Music Brains has been doing that like really well in the sense that we haven't had like people complaining a lot in at least in recent times. And given that we've taken, as I said earlier, we we're pretty good at like taking learnings from one project and then applying them on others. So we also haven't really had any specific problems in terms of like schema changes that would cause users to be angry at us but overall what happens is that if we're doing like anything around anything that critical it goes through like a huge amount of testing and like extensive code review just to make sure that it's all actually working and it'll all happen well and then we have specific release dates where we basically have like an entire document written on the, the things that we need to do before the actual release happens and at the end of it, it's mostly just like um, just going through the document and taking the steps one by one and just running through them. We haven't really had like um, much, many problems with them, knock on wood. But yeah, I think it's mostly just like one of those, Music Brains has just been one of those like surprisingly great things about it, where it just like, it walks the line between having a detailed schema and having users be able to understand what they want to insert into the schema really well. So yeah. But other than that, just in terms of like actual schema changes, it's mostly just us being like very thorough about what data we're changing because that can lead to huge and we're just very productive of the data of the data that we have and of the standards of our data. So anything that basically touches that just goes through a lot of review before it actually reaches production. And closely related to the underlying representation of the data is the APIs and the attributes that are available in the responses and the interfaces that are available to end users of the project. So I'm curious how you approach versioning and evolution of those interfaces for people who are consumers of the different projects that are managed by the MetaBrains Foundation. So for listening, our basic philosophy right now is that we don't really try. We try to just not break anything unless we really, really need to. And we haven't made any specific API API changes that might have made clients incompatible or anything. We haven't made any breaking changes in the time that I've been here. But Listen Brains is like relatively young. It's only it's only been like five years to it. So yeah. But overall. I think what we really do for for music being specifically like what we've realistically done is that we've had a version version one of our API that and a version two of an API as running simultaneously and we'd say that we want to disable version one in the next few next x days or something and eventually just keep running for years and at some point it'll just happen is that what will just happen is that we just don't have enough resources to maintain it and at that point we'll just like switch it off. But when we do switch it off, we do have like people coming in and complaining because we switched it off. But at that point, it's mostly just us. Like we just point them to the blog post that we had made years ago saying deprecate this part of the API on this day. And then we deprecated it like years later. So it, we haven't had really like a huge number of people um, complaining about that. So, but our general philosophy is we try to make as few breaking changes as possible and only make breaking changes when they are absolutely necessary because just breaking clients can be a pain. Uh, and I personally maintain a Python client for the Listen Brains API that as a personal project. And so that basically gives me the point of view of both a developer and like and a maintainer of the API. So that, that really helps keep all of this in context. And 
As you said, the primary focus of the different projects in the MetaBrains Foundation are oriented around data having to do with music and its associated information. And there's the recent introduction of the BookBrains project. I'm wondering if there are any other domains that are being considered for building a new platform for and what the process is for introducing that idea or kickstarting a project for it. Mm -hmm. So... Just for context, BookBrains basically started as a community project where someone from our community took, like, they wanted something like that for books, something like Music Brains for books. And they just started hacking on it. And it eventually became, it eventually started being used by a lot of people in our community. And at that point, it just made logical sense for us to actually just, just take care of maintaining it as well. But, but right now, I'd say that we already have, like, too many projects and a bit too little capacity. And we specifically need to focus because of all the uncertainty due to the pandemic and COVID-19 and all that stuff. So I don't really see any new projects that MetaBrains will start anytime soon. We already have like a bunch of fledgling projects that need a lot of love. But people have definitely asked us for stuff like movie brains or food brains or like recipe brains. Uh, I'd personally love to see those. But I don't think that it's very realistic for us to build any of those right now. And the thing that we really want to actually move into is like music recommendations. So if you think about it, right now we have like just enough data to actually get started on building a initial version of an open music recommendation engine. We have like people's music listening history. We have data about what music actually sounds like. We have music metadata. So what we're actually thinking of is basically building a developer friendly developer friendly tool or something that basically helps people get started on building music recommendation engines without having to actually go through the entire process of the data collection that most companies need to do before they can actually do anything anything that's actually valuable. So the music recommendation thing is actually like completely dominated by non open players a bit right now. We personally feel that we can democratize that. We can like change that. But as always, it's like a long game. It's <laughs> it's not going to happen tomorrow. The first version that we'll probably build will be like it'll probably be really bad, but at least it'll be open. So what uh, in in general, like our experience is that in and in these things, like when we build something and it's the first version, so it's obviously very bad. But someone will come to us and tell us that okay, this is just like bad, and most probably they'll help us fix it. So it becomes a bit better and then someone else might come and help us. And eventually it just like, it takes a long time. It definitely doesn't happen in the short term, but overall in the end, it becomes like a good product or a good project. So that's what we're like hoping for in the future of MetaBrains. But in terms of like new platforms or new data sets, I don't think that anything else is like really realistic in the future. And as far as the ways that the information and the projects that are curating that information for MetaBrains are being used, what are some of the most interesting or innovative or unexpected projects or uses of the data that you've seen? Hmm. So a very interesting thing that I saw like um, a few weeks ago on Twitter was a user basically took his listen wave data and put it into Splunk. Splunk is a logging utility. Like we use it for MetaBrains doesn't use it, but it's generally used for um, like logs, and you can make graph out of the logs. And so that was that was really interesting. The user they they actually like created real time graphs of their listening history in the sense that this is the top artist that I listened to this week, and uh, stuff like that out of Splunk. And and because they were using our API, they could just like hit our API every five minutes or so and get like very real time data. Obviously, that doesn't like scale to the number of users we have. And I was like personally working on solving those problems for all the users that we have. But yeah, that that was a very interesting use that I saw. Another interesting use that I was like pretty impressed with was like one of our contributors basically built a artist recommendation engine based on just music based data. So what they basically did was that in terms of like if you have an artist and you want to calculate like um and you want a bunch of artists that are similar to them. 
So to do that, what they basically did is that they used the number of compilations that the artist was in and just like put weights on that and basically just recommended the artists that were in the same compilation as the artists that you had for a number of times. And that was like a really innovative way to actually calculate similar artists in my opinion. And yeah, that was fun. And your point of the user hitting the API every few minutes also brings up the question of scalability of the services that you're running because of the fact that these are globally accessible. How do you handle things like potential DDoS attacks or rate limiting of users to ensure that the service is accessible to everybody who wants to use it? Hmm. So if we're talking about... um, So MusicBains is basically used by a lot of people. So we have specific rate limits on music veins and we ask people for support. And basically what that means is that if they support us and like sign a contract with us or thing, then we might actually uh, relax those rate limits a bit. In terms of listen veins and acoustic veins, we haven't actually had many problems with actual scaling of it yet. And we basically, we still do have a rate limit of some kind there in the sense that like, I think, yeah, like we do have like a rate limit of the number of requests that you can send in a particular time period, but we haven't really matured it in the sense that if someone starts um, supporting us or thinks that we relax the rate limit a bit. But yeah, I think overall the infrastructure is there, but it's not very mature yet. And from your experiences of being a contributor and maintainer of some of these different projects in the MetaBrains Foundation, what are some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned in the process? So this is a relatively embarrassing story that I have. So this is almost three years ago. And when I just started with like MetaBrains contributions and stuff, I was basically working on like calculating listen range statistics using uh, Google's BigQuery service, right? And this is basically the first time that I like I was writing actual production code that was actually going to be used by people. <laughs> so what basically happened was that Google changed their API just a bit. And that led to like a bunch of breakages, which eventually led to a bill, uh, a monthly bill of almost like 33k dollars. And that was like a huge learning experience for me in in general engineering terms, because like I, after that, I really like started thinking about things in terms of like, how will this fail? Just like uh, adversarial mindset on it. Like, how could I make this break? And that is like definitely one of the biggest learning experiences that I've had with uh, MetaBrains. Other than that, like more recently, I think it's been interesting to realize like how you can actually amplify your contributions by helping others create more stuff. Like initially, when I just started with MetaBrains, I used to just like write code. And that basically meant that my output was equal to just my output, right? But right now, I don't really like, I I haven't been getting much time to actually write MetaBrains code in the last like month. But I have been like mentoring students who mentoring Google Summer of Course students who work full time on it. And it basically means that some part of my effort gets amplified and it basically creates like multiple times the value that I would have created just myself. So that was like a really nice learning that I had in recent times. And I'm really interested in like exploring that further and seeing how people actually do that on scale. So in terms of the future direction of the different MetaBrains projects, what do you have in store for the future? And are there any new capabilities or new directions that you're excited about or that you are looking for any particular contributions for? Yes. So in terms of like um, very near future, we've been working very hard on listen range statistics. We've been implementing graphs left and right almost every week. And we have this cool graph called Artist Origins now, which basically is a world map of the artists that you have listened to. And stuff like that is really nice because it like leads to thinking about geographical diversity and stuff like that. And those graphs are something that I've been really excited for a while now. And it's nice to see them in actual production and users actually using them. In the medium term, I'm really excited about adding more social features to listen brains, stuff like following people, stuff like playlists, stuff like having friends, stuff like user compatibility. I'm also very excited about what we do with recommendations. And just a caveat that we're not like experts on recommendations. We're just starting out. And if anyone like actually wants to help us, we'd be really, really happy to get those contributions in. 
like that would be very valuable to us. Are there any other aspects of any of the MetaBrains projects or the foundation itself or the overall space of music related data that we didn't discuss that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? Yeah. The one thing that I just like to point out is that because that I personally that I personally really, really like about MetaBrains is in terms of like working, is that we're all like really passionate about it. So it makes it very easy to like actually just keep working on stuff and get burnt out. And we really like try to make sure that that doesn't happen to our contributors who like are very passionate about stuff. I really like the fact that even though the work that we do, it might be slow, but we're like still consistent and like we still have like consistent and good improvements released almost all the time through the year. And yeah, all our projects are long game. So that the consistency is really the thing that we're looking for. And that's when really like to see that people understand that. Yeah. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you or follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And with that, I'm going to move us into the picks. And this week, I'm going to choose the Beats project. I had them on the podcast a while ago, but it's a Python application for being able to easily organize your music and actually takes advantage of the music brain's information to be able to update your tagging of your uh, files and ensure that things are organized properly into the albums and artists. And uh, it's just a really great way to easily get a whole mess of MP3s in various random directories into a cleanly organized and well-maintained set of music and being able to access that easily. So definitely recommend that for anybody who's struggling with a hard drive full of music files. And so with that, I'll pass it to you, Param. Do you have any picks this week? Okay, I was like completely prepared for this. But let me think. My pick personally would be an artist. Like given the music team, I'd, I'd like to take this time to maybe pick an artist that I really like and that most people might not have heard of. The artist's name is Pratik Kaur. He's a Indian he's an Indian indie pop like singer who has this song called Cold Slash Mess, which I really like. And I've been listening to that for a long time since now. So that's my pick for today, I guess. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and share your experience as a contributor and maintainer of projects at the MetaBrains Foundation. It's definitely a very interesting set of projects and something that I've benefited from a number of times. So I appreciate all the time and effort you've put into that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our other show, The Data Engineering Podcast, at dataengineeringpodcast.com for the latest on modern data management. And visit the site at pythonpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at podcastinit.com with your story. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers.